And now it is my great pleasure. I think we're time, it's time to move on, don't you? Yes. I think that Dr. Heberly, Renee Heberly, great friend of our event, been here many, many times, enlightened us, added to our festivities in many ways. Very blessed that Renee could be with us. She's so busy. It's always amazes me that she can find time to do it. And she's going to be telling us about tracking efforts to ban critical race theory. Where do we stand? And so Renee, when you are ready, take it away. Oh, when I am ready, let me see. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, good. Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today for being part of this conversation. Um, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint um, just because it keeps me on track. Uh, you know, I was, um, <laughs> every time I think about this issue, I just wanna scream and tear my hair out. So I thought maybe I'll just do a performance video of me screaming and tearing my hair out. And um, I'm afraid that this will be more of a polemic than it will be an analytical discussion because I mostly just want to scream and tear my hair out for the reasons I hope will become clear in my discussion of the so-called controversies uh, roiling the nation about critical race theory or something that is being called critical race theory. And I'm assuming that the folks on this call know what that, re what that actually refers to as the uh, relatively obscure, but nonetheless profoundly important and influential uh, area or approach in legal scholarship that tries to sort out the, that was, um, I don't want to say founded, but because I don't even think Derek Bell ever called critical race theory, critical race theory, but uh, Kimberly Crenshaw did. And that sort of became a way of gathering a number of different scholars, many of whom had subtle disagreements and were engaged in an incredibly nuanced conversation, but it really challenged the whole narrative about uh, how rights and formal legal processes and reforms would uh, continue to manifest in racial progress in the United States of America and would, um, and they challenged the, many of these were civil rights litigators. Derek Bell was an NCAA, NAACP litigator for the Legal Defense Fund for years and litigated about 300 different school segregation cases before he became a law professor and began writing about what would then become critical race theory. So these were people who through blood, sweat and tears were trying themselves uh, to come to terms with their own disillusionment about the American legal system and about whether the rights as they were being implemented and reformed under US law could actually constitute or ever would actually constitute racial progress or um, support racial, actual racial progress in the United States because of the conditions that Bell and uh, Crenshaw and others were looking at in the 70s and 80s that demographically and in terms of inequality and in terms of the racialized conditions in the United States, we're showing that in fact, the Voting Rights Act had not saved us, that the Civil Rights Act had not saved us and that we need some, you know, to stop doing the same old thing over and over again, expecting different results, which is the definition of insanity. Um, so that's where, and so that's my sort of very short narrative about critical race theory itself. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I'll try to share my screen here to give you a sense of um, how uh, to, to engender discussion about how this happened, that this critical race theory, and I'm sure that most of us are sort of, you know, baffled and, and stunned and surprised by the fact that all of a sudden critical race theory is being mentioned on Fox News, you know, 1900 times in uh, uh, the course of a few months and why why that is. Um, but uh, let me see if I can share this. I keep promising to do that and then I'm continuing to talk, which is why I don't use PowerPoints. But anyway, um, I'm just bad at it. Uh, let me see, desktop one. It's not letting me share. Do I need permission to share? 
No, you should go on the bottom of the screen. It says uh, share screen. It's a yeah. green arrow. And then you need to point to the section of your uh, computer where the uh, the content is. And then it should then appear in the Zoom window. Yeah, yeah let me I know all that. that. I'm afraid I'm having to change my system preferences. So I'm just going to try to do that oh. really quickly on my computer and see if that works for me. Um, I'm going to have to quit briefly and come back. If you can just be patient, I'll quit briefly and come back really, really quickly. Uh, Glad you're all here. She will be back. This is the joy of technology. Every once in a while, it just backs up and we have to be flexible. This is a great day. The sun shining. We have our proclamation from the mayor. And you know, if we lived in Iceland, we'd be shopping for books because that's what they do on Christmas Eve is they give each other books. I think it's a lovely, lovely idea. But that's how they celebrate Christmas Eve in Iceland. We, this year we're going to be doing some breaks because that's best practices. I will probably be here much of the time and in and out. Hi, everybody again. I'll try to um, share now to see if my reset worked uh, to allow me to. And it looks like it did. So here we go. All right. Oh, yeah, I see. Thank yeah. you. Um, excellent. Thank you for your patience. I can't wait till we're all in the same room again, for obvious reasons. Me too. All right. So censoring critical inquiry, the fight, and I put in quotation marks over critical race theory, aka divisive concepts. And I put divisive concepts in there because that's the language being used in the Ohio legislation as we speak being considered by the state, Ohio Committee, uh, the, the Committee on State and Local Government in the Ohio Assembly. So, um, I, you know, I think you'll discover throughout our discussion why I title it this way as an act of censorship. Um, and I just wanted to briefly discuss how the national discussion about uh, CRT, critical race theory, moved from zero to 60 in, in one short year. And what that, I, I think that just sort of speaks volumes about where our uh, political culture is right now and the ways in which this kind of moral panic, so to speak, can, can take, light, take light and how it is that the conservative movement has become so skilled in doing this. Um, Secondly, uh, why did the national discussion about CRT move from zero to 60 in one short year is another question I was posing for this uh, conversation. And, second, and finally, what is the actual status of legislative initiatives to censor discussions about racial dynamics and what can we do? So I found the best article so far, very brief, very quick, but very uh, smart article to be in the New, York, New Yorker. And I put the link up here. So if anybody wants a copy of these PowerPoint slides, because I've linked some of the um, information that I'm offering to where I found it, um, offers a timeline of this. And the timeline is pretty remarkable that in the spring of 2020, a gentleman named Christopher Rufo, who had been a one-time filmmaker, who then, just to add to his biography a little bit, um, ran a very... Um, a uh, very controversial campaign for city council in Seattle. And because of the kind of campaign it was and because of the reputation that he developed in Seattle for being incredibly provocative and um, from a right-wing perspective, he moved out to a smaller town and was kind of, you know, at sea, so to speak. He didn't really know what he was going to do next. But he started getting some emails from his friends and some Zoom screenshots and some anecdotes about various kinds of diversity training that um, people were experiencing in corporate headquarters and in university spaces and in other kinds of places. And he started to look into the texts, Robin D'Angelo and Ibram X. Kendi, that have become reasonably popular for usage in these um, in these kinds of trainings. And he began to read those and he noticed that in the footnotes, they're referring to something called critical race theory as uh, developed by Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, among many, many, many others. 
And so he began to, uh, he composed an article about these anecdotes and about his, you know, two months of study of critical race theory in the City Journal that is a newsletter sponsored by the Manhattan Institute, which is a think tank espousing conservative free market values. So the, the, the cohesiveness of the right-wing political ecosystem is remarkable because the day after that came out, he, or a few, I'm sorry, a few months after that journal article came out, he's appearing on Tucker Carlson on Fox News to discuss his brilliant insight and discovery that critical race theory, this dangerous doctrine of Marxism and anti-patriotic uh, uh, dogma is actually inspiring these uh, texts that are being used for these trainings. And literally the day after he's on Tucker Carlson, President Trump's, then President Trump's chief of staff calls him and he is in, D in Washington, D.C. the next week for consultation. So literally zero to 60, you know, in a matter of months, this takes off because it just, you know, appeals to the quick and dirty ways in which the culture wars can be fought and, and ignited, basically. And he says this in The New Yorker. He doesn't, you know, hide the fact that he, he loves the phrase critical race theory because it's, it's scary. It did something that other kinds of uh, appellations like wokeness and other kinds of words didn't do or political correctness was getting old, right? So we come up with this new phrase, critical race theory, and it's actually a thing that people are studying and talking about. So, um, so all of that is in the New Yorker article and uh, briefly spelled out. So the campaign is launched uh, late September 2020. President Trump issues an executive order prohibiting this is three weeks after he meets with Christopher Rufo. So you know a whole lot of study has gone into this, right? No, but the campaign is launched. Issues an executive order prohibiting following from being included in trainings in any institution from corporate corporations to federal agencies to universities that are in receipt of federal funding. And so I just listed these bullet points because I think that this executive order then translates into a lot of the language being used in the legislation in the 27 states where it's either being passed or uh, considered in order to try to control and micromanage the ways we talk about race in K through 12 and at the university level. So that's why I highlighted this because they you see it repeated almost everywhere. Again, this kind of um, ecosystem that just picks up pieces of information and then reframes it and places it into legislation. So we're not allowed to say that sex or race, one sex or race is superior. Well, if you hear anybody saying that, then I'd like you to send them my way because I would disagree with them too. An individual is inherently conscious or unconsciously racist or sexist by virtue of their race or sex. Well, you know, all of us know how complicated that line is, right? Uh, consciously or unconsciously racist or sexist by virtue of their race or sex. Critical race theory tries uh, very hard not to be essentialist in this manner. It is a structural critique. It is not a critique of who it is that is white or black. It's, so that, that just is not right. It's not true. A person should be discriminated against because of their race or sex. Well, I don't think any Anti uh, diversity trainings are saying that. A person's race or sex makes them responsible for trans transgressions of that race or sex. Now there, that one really needs a lot of discussion, right? You know, are we, what do we mean by responsibility? How do we think about it? And critical race theory, but not just critical race theory. In fact, all, all of the scholarship that they're trying to lump into critical race theory addresses this. And it's 200 years worth of discussion that they're putting into a bullet point and trying to prohibit people from saying. Um, this is why I want to tear my hair out and scream when I talk about this, because as a scholar, it's both in, in, it's, in, it's, it's uh, offensive and insulting that they treat the 200 years of hard-won scholarship like this um, and thought that has gone into this. Uh, a person's race or sex, uh, that a person would feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex. I hear that bullet point repeated a lot in the school board meetings in my town in Chelsea, Michigan, which is a very um, homogenous, pretty white town, but it also has a fairly, you know, stable and reasonably progressive school board that is trying to initiate DEI initiatives. And like many other school boards, it's been under attack. And I hear parents saying all the time that their white children are being made to feel guilty or feel bad about who they are. 
And that's not the role of public schools. No, no public school should be making little white children feel bad. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, no, no children are testifying. I'll just put it that way. It's their parents and who knows how that's translating in terms of what the children are, are actually experiencing. Um, now, hard work ethic is inherently racist or sexist, and this is often paired with the idea that critical race theory and it's whatever it is that the right wing thinks it is, uh, is saying that meritocracy is inherently racist, that notions of meritocracy are inherently racist. And um, I'm pretty certain that none of them have read uh, the kind of uh, deep work that has shown empirically how meritocracy is not a neutral standard, uh, that meritocracy is something that is, it's not an empty concept, that, we're, that it is filled in with history and context and what deserves merit and what doesn't. So again, these bullet points simplify massive amounts of thought and work and, and hard, uh, hard discussions that we've had over the last 50 years or 40 years that I've been involved with, and I know that they have preceded me by hundreds of years. So, so once this, uh, this language is put into place in this executive order, uh, we see a so-called trickle-down effect, if you will. Um, and the, the campaign on the part of the American Legislative Exchange Council and state legislators in Republican-led states begins. And uh, it begins primarily with Fox News. And this is just, again, it's just a, it's a, it's just remarkable that Media Matters um, reports in, Jul on, in July that Fox News mentioned critical race theory 1900 times in the year prior. And the thing is from that zero to 60 image that I'm giving you, it's like, it mentioned it three times in June, 2020. And it mentioned it 901 times in the month of June, 21. And so uh, you can see how the sort of rhetorical uh, speed with which this uh, and, and the rhetorical punch that this takes in terms of Fox News coverage. Um, as of August 26, 21, 27 states have introduced bills or taken other steps that would restrict teaching critical race theory or define how teachers can discuss racism and sexism, which is according to an Education Week analysis. 12 states have already enacted legislation. We're already hearing stories of courses, especially by adjunct professors being canceled, not because the state actually came in and said, cancel that course because it is in, not, in, not in compliance with the law, but because the university is afraid that it might not be in compliance with the law. So we're already hearing those stories and the Ohio State and Local Government Committee of the Ohio House of Representatives is debating HB 322 and 327 uh, last week and this week for to bring it to the floor to for a vote in the in the coming weeks. So I want you to imprint those House Bill 322 and 327 on your brain so that if you have time, you're able to just uh, have a look, read the legislation, and send a few emails, depending on how you feel about what that legislation says. Uh, but those are the bills that will drive this, that will take it to the floor for debate and uh, a vote. And they're currently in committee. They're taking testimony, and they're also, certainly the committee is still, um, is still very relevant to send an email. So I, I want to say that you know, we can get caught up in all the details of the legislation. We can get caught up in the language. Does it affect K through 12? What are they trying to do with colleges and universities? But I just, I just think that we're better off instead of being put on the defensive about critical race theory, because some of us, including myself, are kind of critical of it. You know, I mean, we don't totally agree with everything that critical race theory says. We think maybe that this, that, you know, another um, flashpoint here that I failed to mention so far that is incredibly important is uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones's uh, 1619 project that was published in the New York Times in 2019. And if you're not aware of it, then please have a look at it. Um, it's very easy, easily accessible, so easily accessible because it was the New York Times that it started making it into K through 12 curriculums in high schools, especially in social studies classes. And that just set people, that has been sort of rolled into this whole fear-based, you know, sensorial movement um, because the 1619 Project 
um, reframes American history. It says the founding of the what the U.S. is right now should actually date to the first slave ships arriving in 1619. It should not date at the time when the Declaration was written down or the Constitution was ratified. What built this country was slavery, where the dynamics of slavery was the battle about slavery, was the war about slavery, and the legacy about slavery. Now, that's a really <laughs> sort of huge shift in the narrative, right? And that shift in the narrative did not was not invented by the various authors who wrote essays for the 1619 Project. That narrative has been being argued by W.B. Du Bois and by Martin Luther King and by all kinds of scholars for the last several hundred years. But that, that particular sort of representation of it caught people's attention for better or for worse and became part of the flashpoint of this whole debate. Um, and so what I want to focus on, instead of defending those pieces of literature or scholarship, which I do not consider need any defense, and instead of trying to, as I've sort of contradicted myself today, instead of constantly trying to explain, well, critical race theory really isn't being taught in K through 12 schools and, you know, all of that stuff that we keep hearing, instead of that, I would like to just go on the offensive and say this is censorship. <laughs> this is micromanaging educational practice. Educational practice is not just about giving information because you'll hear all the proponents of these bills and the people who are scared and worried about critical race theory saying, we don't have any problem with talking about W.B. Du Bois and his accomplishments. We don't have any problem with talking about slavery and how it was bad. I mean, we want to talk about those things, right? But the debate is how we frame them. The debate is the narrative. The debate is how we place those within the context of racial progress or something else. So the, the debate is not about the information, which you tend to start hearing as you listen to the back and forth on the talking head shows. The debate is really about how we're framing the narrative. And that's, to me, as a humanist, that's what education is about. It's about presenting information and then inviting students into the debates about how to frame that narrative. Because the students can learn that the first slaves came to Jamestown in 1619 and they can learn what happened, right? And that is, that's good. That's something that they should know. But that's just empty information. That's just a point of data. That's a data point. And for me, education is how we frame that. And so what they're trying to do is micromanage the means by which we frame this, these points of information. And that is what I think is so important to go on the offensive about in terms of calling the censor, not just calling it censorship, but saying quite, quite openly, look, Color, the idea of racial, of the inevitability of racial progress and the idea of colorblindness themselves are ideologies. They are framings. They are narratives. There are alternative narratives to those things. And if children don't learn that those are all, there are alternative narratives, then they are not learning. They are being indoctrinated. And so the right through, and if you read every single piece of legislation, listen to every single debate, Two, of, two things keep repeating themselves. One is, we should teach students about colorblindness because that's the only way to think about this. And two, we should teach students that the United States is the best country on earth and has been making racial progress even if we're not there yet. Those are the two things that are not, ex not totally explicit, but in every single piece of legislation, the way they describe what it is that they want, because it's not just that they don't want something, they want something. So when I'm thinking about this and I'm listening to the debates, I get a little frustrated about all the back and forth about, well, CRT is this, no, CRT is that, and yes, it's Marxist, no, it's not Marxist, and it's a critique of critical legal stuff. You know, I, you can hear and have all of those debates um, Tucker Carlson isn't the best place to have those debates, neither is MSNBC, neither is CNN, neither are the pages of the New York Post. Um, you know, part of me is glad that it's out there. Part of me says, oh, this is a teaching moment. This is something where we can actually get out there and Kimberly Crenshaw can have her uh, place in the sun and speak to this incredible sort of field of research that she has been so influential in. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that in that sense. I always try to see these kinds of controversies is also opportunities and teaching moments because that's what we do. 
On the other hand, when it comes down to the legislating, when it comes down to the state coming in and saying, you must teach colorblindness, you must teach racial progress is inevitable, you must teach these things, that's where I absolutely draw the line. And that's why I, my head, that's where my hair starts standing on end and I start getting really um, frustrated, as you can hear in my tone today. So um, this is a squelching of the debate about our racial history. And I just want to, uh, you know, say the obvious and that it could be Marxism, it could be feminism, it could be Holocaust studies. The Ohio legislation uses the language of divisive concepts and, and uh, argues that anyone who teaches about the 1619 project, for example, is inculcating uh, students. Now, that's not very nice grammar but, or vocabulary, but that's the word they're using is inculcating things. Um, and, and so, again, all of these things can fall under the category of divisive concepts. And, I, and I, I, I agree with the ACLU activists that I've been working with on this in the state of Ohio, because they are um, not only making the argument about censorship and the micromanagement of state micromanagement of education, um, but they are pointing out the ways in which um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, that 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 is it's it's not one. The, the, these pieces of legislation are not enforceable on the face of it because nobody really has an enforcement. None of them have an enforcement mechanism. Are they going to ask students to report on these things? Are they going to have uh, cameras in the classroom? We're going to have body cams on cops. We're going to have body cams on teachers to make sure that they're not you know saying the wrong things. Um, so there's no enforcement mechanism, and the language of them is so vague as to be what the ACLU and any free speech First Amendment advocate would call chilling speech. That's what it does. It chills speech. It makes us hesitant to bring something up because I don't want my university to lose funding. I don't want my university to be on the front pages of the Columbus Dispatch as the Ohio legislature sort of tries to figure out what to do about the fact that I'm teaching critical race theory. Um, so it chills speech, it constitutes, it, it, it narrows our, our capacities as educators much more than it actually tells us to do one thing or another. Uh, and if you read the legislation, you'll see just how vague and odd it is, because when you try to micromanage such a complicated project of educational practices and the framing of narratives, you just get all twisted up into knots. I mean, the legislation is a mess, and most people, I think even the authors of it might agree to that. Um, it, is, it is also very formulaic. You can see the commonalities because the American Legislative uh, uh, Executive Council has been involved in creating uh, model legislation and spreading it to various legislatures to have this passed. So I just want to wind up with two readings of all of this mess that we're in right now with critical race theory and our educational policy. And that is to say the most generous reading of the initiative would be to say that they wish to legislate it out of the classroom or employee training rooms because they disagree with it, right? Tucker Carlson, Christopher Rufo, Ben Shapiro, the Ohio uh, Republicans sponsoring this education, uh, they just disagree with this stuff, which, you know, that's the most generous read. It's still censorship, which is not, <laughs> not good, but it's like, yeah, they really do disagree. They're really worried about the kids. They really do think that this is just wrong, that it's just not good. A less generous reading of this that we'll hear on the news a lot in the talking heads is that the Republican party lacks a policy agenda. So they need to give constituents a reason to vote for them. And what better reason to vote for them that they are saving children from being accused by their teachers of being white, which makes them racist. And that just rings so powerfully for many of the parents that I've borne witness to in terms of how they've spoken at the school board meetings in my town where this has come up. Um, so it's been a very successful campaign in that sense so far. Uh, what should we be talking about? I've, I think I've already talked about all of that. Um, this is just my very brief way of taking action. I've read the legislation. When you read legislation, for those of you who have not yet, um, the Ohio Revised Code is a million pages long and every piece of legislation is a million pages wrong. What you want to do is, it's, it's always a revision of given legislation, so what you want to do is look at the underlined pieces of the legislation that you can find if you Google House Bill 322 in Ohio. 
if you Google that and pull up the legislation, just read the underlined pieces. That's the important part. And compose an email in response. These, uh, these um, websites also give you all the committee members. And you'll notice that this is not in the Committee on Education because they could not get the support for it in the Committee on Education in the Ohio Le Assembly. They, they deliberately put it in the uh, Committee on State and Local Government, which is not about education, which is just bizarre in terms of legislative procedure. But that's where it is right now, and that's where you'll find it if you look at these, um, if, you, if you Google it. The best website and organization, well, not the best, but one of the organizations that I've uh, come across and, and worked with um, in, in combating this is uh, called Honesty in Education. And this is a statewide initiative to take up, and it's sponsored by the League of Women Voters in part, to take up what it is that legislators are trying to do with education and to track it. And, you know, for better or for worse, to try to just make sure that the public knows what kind of legislative initiatives are happening. And so Honest Education Matters is the website where you'll learn a lot more about what they've been doing and what kind of action steps that we can take to try to, um, conf you know, to try to confront and deal with these, these initiatives. Because I wasn't really paying attention to this until uh, I guess early last summer, because I thought it was just something that would come and go, but it hasn't. And so it's still here. And so like it or not, we're looking at something that could actually pass in the Ohio Assembly. It's passed in many other states and 12 other states. And so um, if you don't want the state to be in your classroom, I mean, it already is in so many ways, but on these grounds, if you don't want it to be in your classroom on these grounds, have a look at this legislation. And, uh, and you're welcome to contact me too. I can, I can give you any more information about where to go or what to do. So thanks, that's my, that's my rant. I usually don't rant in these sessions, but I just, I was feeling it today. Well, thank you, Renee. I'm glad you did, as you say, rant. Very, very informative. And lots of good information and explanations that I wasn't aware of around this issue. So good job. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, just um, a comment. Uh, this is Moji. Uh, Dr. Heberly, thank you so much. Um, uh, a very enlightening uh, presentation. And I liked how you also um, gave us um, directions or suggestions about how to take action, because that's something that I have had a couple of students or others ask me, what do we do? What can we do? So I particularly liked uh, the information you provided on that la last slide and that you said that we can also contact you assuming that we needed more information or how to go about um, addressing this matter. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Moji. You can call me Renee. If you call me Dr. Heverly again, I'm going to have to like... No, in public, I like to use the <laughs> title, but one-on-one... -on -one, okay, yes. Dr. Moji Sola. <laughs> Thank you. I will return your formal respect. <laughs> it's, uh, Thank you. It's okay. it's so awesome. do we have any other questions or comments? Comments, yeah. Arjun. Yes, you know, I, I could not think, uh, help uh, thinking back to the South African uh, Truth and rec Reconciliation uh, discussions uh, that went back to the apartheid uh, period. And, and I just wonder whether this kind of a legislation is going to kill uh, that kind of a uh, uh, continued conversation about uh, about uh, race uh, in this particular in this particular country and and so yes yeah, definitely they're talking about divisive yes it's divisive because because no, no, uh, you know uh, the there's a divide previous systems allowed it to be divisive and now we that, that is that is such a brilliant analogy I mean I can't even tell you because there because it is re in response to the the black lives the mm -hmm. protest for black lives i mean absolutely and so that is just a brilliant sort of insight um thank you oh thank you 